Okay, today for the, for the Journal Club of the Classics uh, of Immunology, we're going to focus down on a paper uh, from 1953 that came out in Nature. And of course, you all know that that's, that's when the famous paper came out by Watson and Crick in 1953 and the structure of DNA molecules. So that was a very good year. And this paper is very famous in immunology. It's from a, uh, three authors, Billingham, Brent, and, and Metawar. So we're doing Metawar again. We just did him from 1944 and uh, the description of allograft rejection or homograft rejection, uh, defining for the first time that it was a, had to have been a, an immunological problem, but he didn't find any antibodies involved. So that was really sort of the one in the first inkling, one of the first inklings that there was something that ultimately became called cell-mediated immunity. And just before this paper came out in 53, actually a few years before that, in 1948, there was a paper that came out in the Journal of Immunology by a, a person by the name of Astrid Fagreus. And uh, she was at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And she published a paper that is essentially established that the source of antibodies in the body were from cells that uh, were known before, were called plasma cells. And because they had a distinct uh, uh, morphology under the microscope, they were pretty big cells and they had very dark blue cytoplasm under the, the stains that they used. And the reason being is, is that they were making, they were just cranking out antibodies, They're chock full of protein and RNA, making as many much antibodies as they possibly could. So that was plasma cells defining them. What was unknown still at the time was, is that where did the plasma cells come from? They didn't, and, and of course now today, we, we know that plasma cells come from B lymphocytes, but they didn't know that back in 1948. And none of the cells that mediated, whether it's antibody-mediated immunity or cell-mediated immunity, wasn't clear what the cells actually were at this late 40s, early 50s. The immunologic community were sort of working in a black box or working in a dark room with an elephant that they could touch. And they really didn't have a clue what was going on. And it was not an easy feat, let me tell you. So this paper that came out in Nature in 1953, is um, its title is The Active Acquired Tolerance of Foreign Cells. Active Acquired. And, and these people were at the University College London at the time. And for background in this paper, you remember that um, the 1944 paper by Medawar in the Journal of Anatomy, um, he was 29 years old. So, you know, this is almost 10 years later in 53, he was 38 years old. So he was really reaching establishment uh, stature by then. And in the background of the paper, Medawar, uh, Billingham, Brent, and Medawar talk about the fact that this, this, the paper, what it does itself, is the lead off in this discussion, established a, a laboratory solution to the question of how, how could one make allografts tolerant so that you, you could transplant tissues between different individuals. And they said that a, the trick to the whole thing was to uh, inject cells from another uh, animal or, a, you know, uh, or another person into the fetus because the theory was going on, and this was put forth by McFarlane Burnett in, a, in, a, in actually a monograph that he published back in 1949, where he speculated that if you inoculated antigens into the embryo before the immune system had matured and developed um, so that it could have, so that it would mount an acquired immune response, that then you could get tolerance. And he tried to, Burnett tried to show that, but was unsuccessful in his experiments in the late 40s. So in the, in the early 50s, Met Metabar was actually challenged to, to, you know, to do this, to do this series of experiments. So he took up the challenge and, and <laughs> held forth. And because he said that this is what, what he was going to describe was actively acquired tolerance, just like actively acquired immunity, uh, it, it, it was a phenomenon that depended upon injecting of antigen into the, into the host. The host had to be an, it had to be an embryo uh, with an embryonic um, developing immune system. And prior to that time, there was a fellow by the, by the name of Ray Owen. In 1945, he published a little letter to science uh, describing what happens in cattle if they, if they give birth to twins, fraternal twins, 
a cow, the evidently the placenta in cattle uh, is shared by the fetuses. And they usually, there's, you know, it's not like mice where you have six or seven fetus embryos, you only have one or two. But those two animals share a, uh, the placental blood circulation. And Ray Owen described the fact that after they, you know, came to uh, partuition and you had two young calves and so forth and so on, if you studied those those two animals, you found that there was a mixture of red blood cells from one to the other in both in both of the animals, and they uh, and he conjectured that they had to have, have, have exchanged the precursors that make the red blood cells, and that they were living sort of chimeras throughout this whole thing. So that was the beginning, really. That was the first inkling that there's something funny going on in these embryos, <laughs> and, and so um, that's the background. So Medawar, uh, Bellingham Bent and, and Brent and Medawar did a huge number of experiments. And in this paper, they only talk about one experiment, which they said is number 73, where they gave all the, de all the details of this uh, that really, because they said it was the best example of all the different kinds of things that they had done in, in uncovering this whole phenomenon. And the experiment was pretty simple. They would take um, donor A strain, an A strain mouse, and um, do a skin graft on a recipient mouse that was a CBA strain. It's just the designation of the different mouse strains, but they were, they were inbred strains and so that they were like all, all, the, all the animals of a, one particular strain um, were uh, essentially identical twins, but they were disparate so that A and CBA were would, were incompatible with one another. So if you did a, a skin graft between uh, A onto CBA, the usual skin graft would survive uh, 11 plus or minus 0.3 days. So it was very discreet um, uh, endpoint for the survival of the skin graft onto this. And then if you re-grafted re them, another A piece of skin onto the same e CBA mouse that had been the recipient, that would lead to a second set uh, reaction that would come to fruition in only six days. So that was the background of this whole thing. And uh, this experiment number 63, 73, they took a female CBA mouse who um, had been pregnant for about 15 or 16 days. Now the normal gestation period I may have mentioned before is 21 days in a mouse, three weeks. So by, by two weeks, the, the embryos are pretty well formed by then. You can actually see them if you interrupt the pregnancy or if you just open the, if you just make a slit down the skin of the, of the mouse, pregnant mouse, and, and lift back the skin and leave the peritoneum intact, you can see those, those embryos in, in there. And they're sort, of, they're sort of like a horseshoe shaped uh, uterus that have all these, uh, these embryos in there. So what they did was, they, they took this uh, pregnant mouse and they did exactly what I just described. They, they slit down the, they anesthetized them, slit down the, the stomach and, and lifted back the skin. And then the peritoneal membrane on the, on the um, mouse is transparent essentially. So you can see these embryo and they, they inoculated each embryo with a tiny, tiny little bore needle and they inoculated them with only 10 microliters of fluid. 10 microliters, well, 50 microliters is a drop, normal size drop. So 10 microliters is, you can hardly see it, you know? And, and you can imagine how it's not easy to inject these poor little, poor little embryos, but the little embryos, as I've said before, they're only tiny little things, they're only about half a centimeter long. And they, um, they inoculated them with a mixture of uh, tissues that they had um, essentially teased apart and ground up into single cell suspensions from the testy, the kidney, and the spleen from an adult A strain mouse. So that went into the CBA, the mom, the recipient, and into, their, into those embryos. And then four or five days later, they were, the, the, mice, the new mice were born, 21 day gestation period, and they got, they only lost one embryo and they got five out of that whole experiment that had survived the inoculation and so forth. And so they waited for these mice to grow up. Now the uh, puberty occurs around five to six weeks in a mouse. 
So they waited until the mice were eight weeks old. And by this time, they are normal adult stature. They grow really fast um, because <laughs> anyway, they're at normal adult stature. They've been through puberty. And at this stage of the game, they, they put uh, skin grafts from A strain mice onto the, CB, into the CBA um, recipients that had, that had been hopefully tolerized by this injection of, uh, during their embryonic days. And then they waited. They waited, they, they put those skin grafts on and um, two out of the five mice had rejected the, this skin just like they would normal at about 11 days. But three, the skin grafts survived and, and they looked fine and, and the mice just kept on living. So they were tolerant of these skin grafts. So they waited another 50 days, two months basically. And they, they put another skin graft on, onto these two, uh, onto these uh, three surviving uh, mice. And still there was just no, no rejection of that skin graft. So now they waited uh, until day 77 on one mouse and then day 101 on another mouse. And now they were injected with CBA cells uh, that from, from a mice that had been immunized with A strain. So they, they should have primed uh, CBA cells that should reject those um, tumors. And lo and behold, two to three days later, they were rejected the skin grafts on these mice that had been there for 100 days or whatever, 75, 100 days. So they, they basically concluded that th that meant that there was nothing wrong with the grafts. The grafts were still antigenic, but somehow there was a, there was a failure of the immune systems of these mice that had been injected as embryos. And, uh, fa not a failure, but a paralysis. I mean, they just they didn't. They recognized that these um, the A strain uh, antigens, the A strain uh, grafts, as, as being normal part of them. So that was the end of that experiment. There were, there were other things that they reported in this paper. They reported some papers with chickens, because it was easy to to um, to have parabiosis and the and the placental, um, and it was easy to inject them and so forth in in, in the eggs. And they found very similar things. And so, you, you know, nowadays they do with genetic counseling or <laughs> not genetic counseling, but with genetics, they have determined and concluded that uh, birds are really dinosaurs. They're not descended from the dinosaurs, they're dinosaurs, right? Like reptiles have descended from dinosaurs, but birds are the actual thing. And their immune system is not too different from mammals immune system. So that's very, very interesting. And going back into the evolutionary time. So they, they talk about in the discussion, several different things in high end, speculate about this, that, and the other thing, but then they finally move on to the, to the summary uh, of all of their experiments. And so then basically there's just four. And so there's, they, they just, number one is that both uh, birds and mammals can develop tolerance, number one. And secondly, immunologic, active immunologic tolerance is antigen specific. And I forgot, I didn't say that one of the other aspects of their experiments is, is that even though they become tolerant to the A strain, if they put a B strain or a, you know, a Z strain onto those tolerant mice, they'd reject it just as normal. So that that was, they were antigen specific tolerance. That's very important because that's another way that uh, that made them conclude that this had to be an, had to have been an immunological phenomenon. And number three, as I said already, they they said that the tolerant state was um, attributable to the lack of reactivity by the immune system. It didn't have anything to do with the graft. It was the immune system was somehow blind to this uh, antigenic insult, essentially. And the last thing that they concluded was, and they'd done experiments on this, is that the fertility of these tolerant mice was just fine. They were fertile and they could make more babies and so forth and so on, but the babies weren't tolerant. And, and so, because there had been other, other things that said that the, in the cattle, the, the cattle that it had, that it shared a, um, their red blood cells and their, essentially their immune systems were uh, infertile. So that's the end of this paper. You should all read it. It's only three or four pages. Um, the font is like minus 12. Um, so I, <laughs> I had to take out my magnifying glass to get some of the things. <laughs>
But Medawar went, went on to win the Nobel Prize for these experiments in 1960, only seven years later. And at the same time, they, and, and it was for the phenomenon of, of immunological tolerance. That was what the prize was given for. And it was given at the same time to, to McFarlane Burnett from Australia. So it was Medawar and Burnett. And um, if you go on online to the nobelprize.org website and then look for medicine, physiology and medicine awards, and you can see them all from the beginning in 1901 up until the present time. If you look at 1960, then you can, you find biographies for Medawar and Burnett and you'll find their Nobel Prize lecture. And it's very, very interesting. I, I recommend it highly. The only thing that was sort of a hooker in this particular paper was the fact that, and I was surprised, was that Medawar kept talking about the antibody forming system as being responsible for this immunity and, or, or lack thereof of terms of tolerance. So even then, in 1953, they, they still had not thrown off even though he'd had these experiments from 1944 where he couldn't find antibody. And of course he couldn't find antibody in the tolerant mice, but that wasn't surprising because they were tolerant. But they still, the, the antibody reactivity was the sine qua non of immune reactivity until later on as we, as we will come to see. Let me see if I got anything. No, I guess I'll stop there. So if you've enjoyed this video, um, please like, subscribe, and sign up for my newsletter, uh, where I'm serializing my new book, which is called The, the Quest for New Knowledge. You'll find a sign-up link below. Hey, thanks again. It's been great.